Hi, and welcome back to the Ask Me Anything sessions from the Rapid Office in Tanjong Pagar. Uh, as we've been doing all week, we're having informal chats with fintech and payment leaders across the region. You can find us every day in the networking zone in Boat Key uh, or in real life in Tanjong Pagar, and we look forward to having you here in the office at some point. Uh, format of the sessions is relaxed and interactive. It is an Ask Me Anything session. We have 30 minutes for this particular session. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box, and I will try to get to them. Uh, and with no further ado, I'd love to introduce my, my guest, Tanwei Liu uh, from Xverse. Uh, you want to tell the team, tell the audience, uh, a little bit about what you do uh, at Xverse? Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tianwei. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Xverse. So Xverse is a payment infrastructure company that um, you know, our mission is to accelerate the growth of digital business across Southeast Asia. Um, we specialize in helping digital businesses you know, take payments, mainly alternative payment solutions across Southeast Asia, disperse funds, and also provide wallet services. So uh, we currently operate in both Singapore and Indonesia and have uh, present in both market itself. And how did you start your career? I think you started in technology, not necessarily payments. Yeah, yeah. I have an interesting journey. I started off as an engineer. Um, I used to be, a, I was sharing with Joel earlier on, I used to be an engineer at Amazon, uh, working in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Um, I was there about three years. Before that, I was in a startup company. Mm -hmm. uh, that, got acquired by um, Google. They were actually making Android smartwatches. So I was a SDK engineer on Android platform for you know, bringing APIs to allow them to basically um, you know, take on more people on their platform. Eventually, the company got acquired by Google. Mm. So that became the, the Google watches that probably you guys heard of. Nice. And uh, that's been an interesting journey. I think I spent about a total of six years, you know, Part, you know, is because I also came from the Singapore NUS Overseas College program. Mm -hmm. So I was NOC alumni. I spent a year there in school, uh, you know, part-timing at Stanford. Eventually, you know, I landed back in, in the Bay Area working as a full-time as an engineer. So I know I spent about six years there. Um, eventually, you know, the, the Bay Area have, a, you know, maybe it's just the oxygen, the air. Right. There's this startup culture, right? I was always joking, and you probably are from there. I think at a cafe, the Red Rock Cafe in, in, in Mountain View, everyone around you is just talking about you stuff. You can't shut it out at some point. You, you just can't shut it out, right? All your friends and you know, people, your coworker, you know, over beer will be talking about the exact same thing, right? Yeah, this is a good idea. You know, can we work on this? Stuff like that. I think it influenced you a lot, and uh, we are big fans of uh, you know, Paul Graham, um, Y Combinator, Hacker News. Yeah. So there was a committee I was you know, quite you know, intrigued about, and I always participate. So eventually, me and my co-founder, which is also another Singaporean working at uh, Quora, which is my current CTO, uh, decided Quora, to... Quora. Uh, Quora, right. yes, the question and answer website. Yeah, and then, my favorites? Yeah, yeah, it was my favorite too. So what we did is that you know, we decided to you know, take, the, you know, take the plunge. We joined Y Combinator mm -hmm. as their program, and actually you know, that was in late 2015 we quit our job. 2016 we came back and started a payment company. Very cool, yeah. very cool. So is your watch payment ready? Unfortunately, um, no. This is a Xiaomi Mi Band, and, and you... you I think it's interesting. I was just having this conversation with uh, one of my investors the other day that a lot of this innovation and, and stuff we've been trying to work on in the Bay Area that we see, you know, merchant adoption is really not that big yet. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we are probably always a bit behind on the curve in this rich part of the world. And that was actually the big part of the thesis why we, we decided to, to come back and work on payments itself, right? right? Because you know, being you know, native Singaporean, Southeast Asian, even though we work a long period of time overseas, I think one of the, the reasons why we work into payment then was that you know, we, we, we've been constantly traveling back every year, mm -hmm. and we see a lot of innovation. I remember this, this incident, actually, very, very vividly, this incident was that I was working at Amazon at that period. And then as an Amazon employee, I do have employee discount. I was working, uh, you know, there was a Kindle Paperwhite that just came out. A lot of my friend in, in Singapore was pinging me and saying, hey, can you just buy it for me? Mm -hmm. So like, sure, sure. I, I did that. I did a bulk purchase of about 10 device, ship it back. You know, then was like no pay lot, nothing. So when it comes to payment, I think the first thing I thought of being in the Bay Area was like Venmo me, right? Venmo me, right. PayPal, how, how, how is that going to work? And none of that payment option was quite available in Asia. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they were like, I just doing a band transfer. So it's like alternative payment things become the main thing they making, do. Making right? the Kindle very expensive at that point. Yeah. By the point, I remember the incident was almost near Christmas. It was about the same period of time. It was like getting to the end of the year, I still couldn't figure out who's the last two guys who didn't pay me. Mm -hmm. So it was a joke, and we were sending email then. You know, you know, messenger wasn't quite, it was like, like 2010. Apollo, like, just pay my family, and then somehow it'll work out. Somehow it'll work out, right? And that became like a frustration, and also like, you know, with frustration came, like we're a typical engineer, right? We're going to fix this. Yeah. So you know, that's where I, me and my so CTO... So then what did you decide to do? The first thing we did as engineer then is like, you know, the thesis that we formed was that, well, we saw this innovation in, in, in US. We don't see that in Asia. What is the reason there, right? And then 
the first thing that as engineers we thought of, there's no API, right? There's not really a very easy to use API available by the banks that we can automate a lot of this to let, to empower developers, you know, and, and innovators to build things on top of it. Mm -hmm. So when they can start building all these things, you know, all these solutions can be solved. So that was the initial thesis, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing we started doing is, can we be the guys that build the API? So immediately we look into, you know, instead of talking to the banks, <laughs> we started building API on top of the bank. Right. You know, like a bit about crawling, a bit of scripting. We, we got the initial prototype working. So we thought, hey, that sounds like a cool solution. And in a typical Silicon Valley fashion, you pass that to your friends, other engineers look at it and say, hey, I can build something interesting on top of it. Mm -hmm. and, and things start picking up. Like we, we got picked up by some of these remittance players in Singapore itself. Some of the early clients were blockchain company. So that was really interesting. And we, we thought that we are onto something. We should be you know, working more full time on it. And that's where Y Combinator mm -hmm. happened. And so as you started to integrate to the banks with or without their participation, have they started to come along? And you're now, have, um, what's, the, what's the nature of your partnership with the banks today? Oh, I think we came a really long way. <laughs> it has been like, uh, since 2016, almost like a almost five years journey, working with our banking partner and eventually securing that license. Currently today, Express is a major payment institution in Singapore. Congratulations. And we're licensed for e-money since last year. And, and that's through you know, sheer hard work and working with our bank partners, right? I think uh, we have to understand that, you know, when, when I jump into FinTech and I thought, you know, tech is a very important piece, but over the last few years, you know, this is a recurring team that I tell myself, right? Like, we are actually going into the, one of the most regulated space in the world, right? right. And, and that the regulations are there for good reason, right? I think we, we have you know, been in the ground, working with MES over the years. What we quickly understand is, I think MES is one of the most forward-looking regulators already in the world, right, in terms of FinTech space. But I think I was in the chat with a couple of other regulators from other countries, and eventually I come up with a thesis and conclusion is, actually the primary job of the regulators is not to promote innovation, is to protect the consumer, mm. right? Because that is their, their bottom line, right? So when, when we are building a lot of products on top of that and which they do not have enough understanding, they default back to, will this you know, impact the consumer in the wrong way? So basically to build that kind of trust, to, to build them that assurance, you need a, a long track record of actually you know, obeying to the rules, doing the fit and proper you know, processes for a lot of different things. And I think that's pretty much explained our, our five years journey here. You know, we, we first, you know, like you mentioned, without talking to the bank, start working on top of them, right? right. And they see some traffic and they start reaching out to us and ask us what are you working on. Initial years, we, we were quite naive. We couldn't quite understand how to work with them. But over time, we realized that you know, having a, a direct conversation with them, explaining to them, and a lot of them actually are pretty open to that. Right? It's just that they need time to understand you know, whether this will you know, jeopardize some of the other areas they are, they are you know, afraid about and worried about. And that's the same approach. Right? Over the last four years, we built up the relationship with them across multiple different banking partners, across different jurisdictions and countries that you know, this is the better way to work on things. And why do we you know, focus on building this kind of services? Why do we need to build APIs? Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of part of that is education and eventually convincing them with you know, results. Mm -hmm. and, and that has helped us along the way. And so just to make it tangible, you know, what are the primary services you're providing today mm -hmm. and, to, and to whom? Yeah, so in, in Singapore itself, our, our core business is around providing alternative payments. So it's not really uh, credit card processing. Mm -hmm. It's more towards bank transfer, virtual account. I think that concept was quite new in the Asia Pacific. Um, Indonesia have it pretty advanced, but in Singapore, not quite people had heard of that. So we were the one that were early stages of building that because the initial customer space was more towards FinTech, right? So remittance companies I mentioned, blockchain company, crowdfunding companies. The folks like this have issues with taking credit card payments because we are buying a pretty risky investment product which have high chance of chargeback and that's not something they can accept. The next thing is the MDR, right? The MDR involved in each of these transactions is very, very high and they can't do that for an investment product that gives you a returns of 1%, right? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense anymore. So they needed something that you know, is safe, instantaneous and easy to use, right? So and our bank transfer, the core of it was the good solution. But as I explained early on, the problem is with reconciliation, right? They cannot figure out a good way to scale that. So we, we pilot and you know, pioneered the, the, the virtual account system in Singapore, working with a couple of different banking partners. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a big space that we serve in, in Singapore itself. And eventually, the, the, because of listening to what our customers wanted, we expanded to also disbursement of funds, right? Because you, a lot of these platforms are two-way streets, right? They need to receive payments from their clients. They also need to send out to their sellers or to their investors' funds as well. So sending funds via automated fashion, via API, becomes a negative part of what we do. And today that's actually formed a very big part of our business operation in Indonesia itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because sending funds is actually, uh, you know, across banks, real time in Indonesia, is, it's not quite like Singapore, right? Where there's a centralized, you know, fast network. Mm -hmm. You know, today we take it easy to actually just, I was looking back at the journey, it's like just three years back, 
I think it was not actually real time for you to send money from uh, you know, DBS to UOB, right? And, and today we kind of like take it for granted that it is real time. But in a lot of these emerging markets across Southeast Asia, that's not the fact, right? We don't have such a prudent government that's building centralized systems that allow us to, you know, reduce the cost mm -hmm. and have these kind of real-time services. And that's where we come in. Right? We built that in Indonesia as well and provide the same stack of APIs to our clients to provide the exact same service, receiving and sending funds uh, you know, in a real-time fashion that's you know, compliance to local regulation. I think the third and final piece of what we have been doing is more towards, again, what our client wanted. Right? In Singapore, uh, we start to service a lot of clients that have to have stock value. They are you know, having to take deposit and it goes to either facilitating um, trading or actually as an escrow for some transaction going on. And you know, story of fund become a very quickly a regulated space. Yeah. And that's where our e-money license came in. So you know, working with our partners, we eventually uh, make sure that you know, every of this process has proper KYC being done and we can provide the wallet infrastructure that they need to provide you know, whatever services they need to do to their clients. So with the uh, interoperability announcement last week regarding PayNow and Fast, I assume you'll start to see more competition enter the market. Uh, are you going to need to add different types of value-added services in order to maintain sort of a commercial proposition? Or what's your vision for what things look like eight or nine months from now? Yeah, I, I think first we welcome that kind of interoperability. I think that's something that we've been working with the regulators for a while. I think even the Fast project, um, when we first heard about it, you know, like three years ago when we started about it, actually before that, it, I think a good seven to eight years has been gone into talking to different banks to make it work from, I think, the PCS side, which is the banking cost features side. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we already knew that, you know, pay now is the natural next step for them to actually integrate. I think our clients have been uh, starting to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, the main focus is always to listen to what the client wants, right? If the pay now is a solution they are looking at and actually we are integrating and rolling it out, it will be something that we will be adding on to the stack that we offer as an alternative payment solution to our client itself. But if you look at what we have been seeing as a trend, I think more and more businesses that are based in Singapore is looking at you know, how to serve their client outside of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big, biggest market that we are seeing a lot of interest is Indonesia, which we have been on the ground since 2017. I think it took a long time to get things up running as well. So uh, I think more and more of our clients are actually looking at, you know, besides Singapore, what kind of payments can you actually offer us? What kind of alternative payment method, actually? Because like, credit card penetration is not that high. So uh, from a roadmap perspective, we are focusing on you know, providing the, the existing rails that we already have, and on the top of that, add in more alternative payment solution that is localized, hyper-localized to local market needs, like Indonesia, the e-wallets that are top you know, of their mind that they would need, or towards the agent network, the offline payment network. Because actually, from what we have seen from the data, more than 70% of the transactions actually are still happening offline with cash. Yep. So there is a very big opportunity of client that can be served. So that's what we've been focusing on. In terms of, on the agent side, in terms of collecting funds at a warung or dispersing funds out through the warung? Mm -hmm. um, I think the first way is basically to um, collection of funds via the warungs. That's actually what we do today. So we actually have that um, you know, agent network that's pretty well uh, reached out. We partner with some of the local uh, top players. At the same time, we also run our own agent network. So that has seen a lot of traction for us over the last years. So um, I think combined, we have been connected to almost half a million agents. There's you know, mom and pop store. Like in Singapore context, we call them mama shop. I think in Indonesia, we call them warongs. Mm -hmm. So small warongs, they're a small business owner. They're stationary, and, and they provide you know, water, FMCG kind of product. But at the same time, they serve their committees of you know, right. customers. And these are their friends, their neighbors. So from some of the data we've been seeing, they, they serve 60 to 100 customers like they are unique and repeated yeah. on a monthly basis. And these are the guys that we immediately connected to them, providing them uh, either through backend APIs or through their app directly, that you know, they can actually provide an offline payment point to an e-commerce or whatever transaction that's online. So that's the first step, and that has been live for us, and we've been seeing a lot of traction from that space. I think the next step you talk about is something we're very excited, mm -hmm. which is basically allowing uh, you know, the second flow of the funds, allowing them to cash out. Mm -hmm. That's something that we've been working on uh, aggressively, I think uh, regulation side is always a challenge because we're always talking about you know, AML-related um, cases. We believe that we should be able to get something out you know, by Q1 next year, and that's something that you know, we should look forward to. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned MDR a little bit ago as a constraint. I mean, one of the reasons MDR exists, right, is there's a risk that sellers don't fulfill. Mm -hmm. The reason card networks provide chargebacks, et cetera. Are you, in the, are you having to handle reversals and other forms of buyer dispute mm -hmm. uh, using the rails that you support today, or is that something you, don't, you stay away from? I think fortunately enough, I think our, our dispute-related transactions are very, very low compared at least to credit card side because most of these transactions, are, you know, they reach finality the moment the transaction is done because when you do a fund transfer, there's no right, recall for that funds unless really end up being a fraud cases or 
there's some you know, scam going on, you can probably seek you know, um, police help to actually do the refund recall. But uh, I think most of the time, this kind of transaction doesn't happen, that happen. So unlike credit card where chargeback is probably always possible for the next 60 days or even 90 days, depending on the change of mind of the consumer, that is not quite uh, you know, possible in most of the APM that we provide in, um, in Singapore or Indonesia. So, and, and that has been a, a pretty, you know, something that I think our merchants really welcome, especially in a lot of this kind of transaction that we're talking about, right? Where either the value is large or, you know, I think finality is really, really important for them. So I think so far we haven't seen that much of a problem. Okay, fair enough. So I think you've started to move away from bank rails into some blockchain powered rails, is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want to explain a little bit about what you're doing and why you went started to go that direction? Sure, sure. I think last month, X was, uh, you know, after about a year and a half of preparation, announced that we launched uh, Project Straight X, which is uh, our stablecoin initiative for Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, stablecoin that we launched is XSGD. So um, to really distill it down, for how we view it is like this is just e-money on the blockchain. And that is actually something that we've been working closely with our regulator MAS for the last one and a half years, describing and actually letting them understand why, why this shift is needed. Right? From a regulator perspective, I think uh, you know, we have the kudos to them. They are very understanding and they understand what are some of the use cases that we're looking for. Uh, it's more towards like interoperability you're talking about here, right? Because we have been on the ground working with our clients, uh, quite a bit of them uh, in, in the blockchain space. This is the product that they have been asking for. Mm -hmm. They've been looking to see, is there a way that they can build a you know, wallet that's not wall garden across multiple different institutions mm -hmm. without you know, having a centralized guide that they will dictate how will the fund transfer uh, you know, commercial actually works right. or even you know, affecting their user base. I think this is something that I've been observing like in the so-called wallet war over the last five years, right? You see big you know, oligopoly, big corporation coming in. Everyone want to own a pies of this wallet ecosystem. But I think what is the same direction what MES was saying, right? What ends up happening is that you have a lot of wall gardens. Every one of these wallet ecosystems are isolated. You can only use the wallet in, in their own uh, you know, ecosystem. Withdrawing of that is very, very hard. And then you know, having the two of them collaborate sounds like, you know, I think the ice need to freeze over or something for that to actually happen, right? So, so it's, it is tough, right? Because no one wants to you know, lose their users, which they spend a lot of time acquiring and, and, and then having them being going away to another gateway and stuff, sure. right? So, so they've been saying that, but at the same time, you know, building up the water infrastructure is very expensive. Acquiring the users is expensive. The regulation involved is quite difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our clients on the ground is saying that, can you offer us something that is like e-wallet? but at the same time allow me to control you know, how my users are being shared with other people and let me detect and choose you know, who do I want to work with, right? Instead of having someone who just tomorrow decided to freeze my account or should move the funds, right? So we, we look closely at the regulation and that's the same side of what MES is trying to do right now from the, um, you know, having like non-bank institution coming into the fast network, which is allowing them to basically, hopefully you're gonna see soon, they can transfer between wallet real time. The wallet to wallet transfer can be done via fast. I think that's the same concept that what we're trying to do here, right? By, by digitizing Sing Dollar on the blockchain, what we envision is happening is this is just another iteration of e-money. Yeah. Instead of having a centralized uh, a system like Express where you have to connect to us for every single fund transfer request, transferring to another account, we're gonna take that away, right? We're just gonna be a custodian of the, of the funds and also on the regulation side to ensure the consumer is protected, right? Mm -hmm. Which is in line with what MES really wanted, right? Making sure that the deposit that you put in is safely being kept and that is again guaranteed by a bank, which is the whole structure of an e-money regime. Mm -hmm. And then the assurance that you know, there will not be a runaway incidence like what we see in the last few years, not many names, there are some companies that you know, disappear after the, the company dissolve and all the e-wallet values disappear, right? So that's actually the same thing that we've been trying to do, right? So by doing that, we can provide a blockchain-based solution that's decentralized, that's as good as e-money to allow our, our customers to innovate. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been, what we've been seeing. I think that space is really exciting. I, I'm not too sure whether you're aware, I think the DeFi space is blooming. Mm -hmm. And a lot of innovation that we, we are seeing is similar to what we talk about, right? Which is taking e-money, which is something that we all know. Yep. I think regulator understands, all of us understand e-money. Putting it on a, on a decentralized uh, ecosystem like uh, blockchain. The same concept is happening right now for a lot of um, you know, traditional financial solutions, be it lending, mm -hmm with uh, you know, crowdfunding that we are quite you know, well off and think about already and, and then moving that to the blockchain space. And then in order to provide that kind of innovation, they need a new kind of technology to support that. And that's where we see the stablecoin initiative being at. So how do you solve, or where are you in the process of solving the acceptance problem 
mm -hmm. right? In terms of if I can't, I can't send it to a counterparty, I can't spend it at a merchant, is it a value? Are you in the position that you're creating a merchant ecosystem at this point to accept uh, straight tax, or how's that working? I think the, 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 the next three months or six months we'll met, the team half that is focused on straight X will be in the three areas. First, of course, is merchant adoption, right? Liquidity, if you look at, you know, there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of successful stablecoin project out there in the world, I think mostly in the US-based one, which is like USDC, or is it Tether? I think liquidity is the most important part, right? Getting most um, platforms to actually accept it and as a form of payments to actually allow that to be the, the, the denominator for the e-money equivalent stuff mm -hmm. is going to be the big part of the push. So that's what we've been focusing on in the next three to six months. But I think we, we have a slight you know, advantage here whereby a lot of this ecosystem partner that we are serving today has been asking for this kind of product. And that's shown by you know, the recent launch news that you know, the, the number of ecosystem partners that we already have from day one. And that's because we already serve them as clients today. Mm -hmm. right? there, a lot of them are already using our rails from accepting payments to sending funds to storage of funds. This is the product they've been looking for. So the big push next uh, three to six months is getting more of these institutional partners that's really working with us, be it a fintech or exchange or marketplace that's willing to use this kind of product to adopt it. So I think, stay tuned, we're gonna see a lot of some, some of these favorite uh, products that a lot of consumer users will be adopting uh, StraightX or XHD in the coming weeks. The next big area that we are, we are focusing on more to us is um, expanding the ecosystem partnership, right? I think a lot of this um, stablecoin and blockchain in, innovation that we are seeing is more towards the, the US side again, right? I think getting us on the, on, the, on, the, on the world map to let people know that there's such an you know, initiative happening in Asia is going to be very, very important. And we're very happy that in you know, sort of the week, like uh, Jeremy, CEO of uh, Circle, actually tweeted out, right? Because we had to talk to them that this is something they're looking at, right? That, the, the world is going to be moving towards that direction. And, and more, I think almost every central bank right now, even MES, is discussing about issuing their own central bank digital currency because they're starting to understand that yeah, this is just another form of technology from a payment perspective, from a, from a money policy perspective. It's the same thing as in money, right? So that's something that we want to be part of. So we'll be pushing to have more partnership coming up. And the last piece, of course, is to support the DeFi space. And, and that area is really exciting because We've been seeing that, you know, I think the next future, the natural next step for the stablecoin um, ecosystem, what we are seeing is a translation of that to remittance space, right? DeFi remittance, allowing people to swap between different stablecoins, be it a USDC to a single dollar currency, naturally is actually providing a service to let you do remittance at a very, very low cost. Right. But do you see, so let's say that the central banks in general do start to lean into digital issuance, mm -hmm. right? and you've got cross-border interoperability of prompt pay and pay now and seven other things, mm -hmm. et cetera. Does that actually amplify what's happening in the DeFi space? Or does that actually take away a lot of the use cases because the legacy financial world is moving in the same direction? Um, from Exo's perspective, right, when we are working on the stablecoin project, to us, um, Project Straight Act is an infrastructure play, mm -hmm. right? We have been thinking about it. We, ultimately, our DNA is a bit different. We're not really a blockchain or a crypto company. Mm -hmm. We're not an exchange. We don't do speculative uh, product. Most of us, uh, uh, if you look at the team, are in the payment infrastructure play, right? We are a payment infrastructure company. So when we look at um, stablecoin initiative, we're looking at it more from a technology perspective. How can this enable our customers uh, to be able to you know, get the kind of services that they wanted, right? What do the customers actually need, right? And how we see this is that, you know, this will be a step in the right direction to help us uh, improve the liquidity of fund transfer, like how to move funds quickly across borders in the long run how to deal with the interoperability problem that I mentioned early on between different uh, partners of ours, instead of having to discuss with us, you know, how can I deal with some commercial to, to move funds from one of the wallet partners of ours to another wallet partner of ours, that can be something that they can innovate on top of that. Mm -hmm. So that's where we see it, right? So if the banks thus comes in or the central banks start to do this initiative, we highly encourage it, right? Because from our perspective, this is just helping the ecosystem grow. And most of the innovation that you're seeing uh, from a DeFi space is for the other related product, be it lending, be it crowdfunding, be it remittance, which is built on top of this infrastructure that's currently missing. Mm -hmm. So maybe to take a step back to more personal stuff. So it is still a startup, despite <laughs> the tremendous amount of stuff that you've done uh, and products you've been able to launch and the role you've played in the ecosystem. How, how large is the team today and what does the last 10 months or so look like for you guys to get through COVID? Um, I think it's been a long journey. The team currently is about 100 people-ish, um, and that is more towards the payment side of things. Uh, we also have a pretty large uh, ground sales team on, the, on Indonesia itself. Over the last years, which we start to acquire, 
that is very operation intensive. I think the sales force from around there is maybe 100 to 200 people to just work with the warongs that we mentioned earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, the COVID has been quite a journey. I think uh, I was sharing with you earlier on that we were, we were planning to do a big launch about our Indonesia side of things, moving to a new office from a, a previously small office space in, in Block 79. Um, I think that when the COVID you know, happens, we're kind of like surprised by the scale of it. You kind of already knew that it would be a big thing. That, but when it starts to hit you in the reality check, I think everyone is, uh, will be you know, joking if they say that you know, they underestimated it, right? Like, like quite a bit of things have happened very quickly. I think the team is learning to adapt. I, I, I definitely see some plus and merit point. I welcome it. I, I used to, to share that I travel every single week to Indonesia, to Jakarta. Yeah. It's like uh, I took it as much like a bus ride on, sure. on a weekly basis. Because a lot of our operations in the last couple of years or actually in the last nine to 12 months have been heavy in the Indonesia launch, right? Mm -hmm. To preparing us to get the regulation right, to get a product right. I think we are a truly local team. We believe deeply in being on the ground, understanding what the customers actually wanted. So a lot of that you know, initiative was kicked off, I think early of 2019. But as fast forward to 2020, when we are about to you know, do more large scale launches, is where this COVID situation happened. I think it changed a lot of uh, how we are currently approaching the problem. We have to depend a lot on your local teams to be able to execute this, which is uh, challenging, but at the same time, surprisingly that you know, it's working out quite well. And that's something that I think is new for all of us. Has the Indonesian broadband scaled to be able to make <laughs> all of your video calls work properly? I, I think this is really interesting. I, I started traveling to Indonesia um, uh, on a regular basis since 2017, mm -hmm. right? And I think one thing that you do actually see, and that's where we are really excited, is that the broadband connection have definitely improved drastically over the last four to five years, right? I still imagine the first time when I, when I, I was working off an apartment, um, you know, that we were staying there, the internet was really, really bad. We, we can barely get a signal. And then you learn that actually, you know, the, the, I was starting to learn how to look out for cell towers. The, the 3G broadband cell tower, I, I, in the, you know, in Singapore, you, you live in the fact... with the Pringles can. Yeah, yeah. The white-looking thing on top of the building, that is actually the cell tower because you, you just don't think about it when you're in Singapore, right? It's something that I always talk to a lot of engineers, right? Uh, which is a big reason why we came back, I uh, think, from the Valley because a lot of our engineers are from there. Like, we're solving, you know, this is third-world problem, right? Instead of, like, first-world problem that I was used to be solving in Amazon, right? This kind of infrastructures are really quite lagging, right? Like, SMS reliability is really, really bad in Indonesia. Internet uh, intermittence. Some of the technology you apply, you know, might work in Singapore, might not quite work very well in Indonesia due to the bandwidth of, of the internet access. Except, ironically, the affordability is much better. Right? Yes. Compared to your phone bill in Silicon Valley. Exactly, exactly. So, so that is actually why we saw that you know, that market has huge potential, right? I think they're going to be, the, the, you know, I think you talk to any investors or you know, anyone that's been you know, leaving this and comparing it from what they saw in China, Mm -hmm. and in, in India and stuff that, you know, you're going to see the next China being Indonesia itself, where things is going to be leapfrog over there, where they're going to skip a generation of some of the infrastructure that they have. You know, instead of you know, going to the credit card rail, they might just completely skip it or because mm -hmm. there are better ways to solve the same problems today right. with today's technology, right? Because they have the chance to basically, um, I wouldn't say reinvent the wheel, right? To actually build something because the, the previous time, they don't even have the wheel, right? They're actually doing the wheel for the first time. Yep. Right? So if you look at it at the state of the technology, they will be able to choose the best solution that's available on the ground. Right? And, and a lot of these things will surprise us you know, in terms of what they can actually achieve. And with broadband being so accessible now, I think a lot of these consumers are actually getting access to the internet. It will be you know, coming out for the middle class for the first time. And these are huge you know, unserved market that we are actually looking at very closely by supporting them via the offline payment network that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And as you've started to work more with regulators around the region, are you seeing the shift from that consumer protection mindset you mentioned earlier to more of a progressive mindset that's enabling growth? Mm, I think regulators takes time. I think this is, in some sense, that's a good thing. Right? I think not everything should be rushed into because like I mentioned earlier on, their primary objective here is consumer protection. But I think over the first few years, you do see them being more receptive. That's for sure. I think a lot of the different regulators open up their own so-called fintech office. I think we have a chief fintech officer in Singapore. I think you're starting to see that um, in, under the OJK and BI in Indonesia as well. And the same across the board on different regulators. They understand that, you know, that with technology, um, you know, we have to take a different approach to some of this um, regulation. And being able to regulate something versus being able to actually, um, you know, have the right policy to actually encourage the growth is quite a bit of a different thing. 
So uh, definitely they're much more receptive now. You know, you used to be able to have to side guess what they're actually thinking. Now it's like you can have an open dialogue with a lot of them. They're pretty open and they will welcome you for a conversation. You can discuss with them your ideas and they can tell you their concerns so you can address it from day one. Perfect. Tian Wei, pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you. And uh, thank you. And everybody watching, thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone.